anything but ordinary. If we call ourselves Christians, our lives should, be, should seem to others outside of the Christian world as anything but ordinary. We should not be blending in. We should be unique and different. You know, it's one of those things that I say over and over again. We have to keep reminding ourselves that we are committed to Jesus Christ and we should be all in. The series started a couple of weeks ago with the blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, who was being held back by the crowds, who was demonized by the religious leaders and the people of his time as being one of these people that, you know, he was being punished for his sins and stay away from him. But last week was the linchpin in all of this because last week was the great commandments. Jesus throwing it out there. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your being. You should be giving everything for God. You should be totally committed to God as the first commandment. Now this week, I got to stand here and say I, I get nervous because I'm wearing long robes and some reciting prayers and doing all those things he just said don't do. So it's like that millstone is kind of like waiting for me, maybe, I don't know. But I want to take that criticism ser seriously because of the way it sits in the gospel. We can't be hypocritical. We can't say we love the Lord our God and then hold back from God. There are lots of religious leaders that I do know personally and sometimes just at a distance whom it appears that they are somewhat hypocritical in how they preach and how they teach and how they share. But we all need to accept the challenge to not be ordinary. I had met a couple many years ago now who had, uh, we, we ended up at the same table at one of these fundraisers. And we got to talking. When you're sitting at dinner for a little while with people, you get to talking. And they said, you know, that they'd had eight children. I'm like, wow, that's great. You know, five natural, three by adoption. And they all ranged from teenagers at that point to grade school. I'm like, oh, okay, it sounds like it's going to you know, be an interesting household. And they said, oh, no, you know, everybody does their part. Everybody shares. They, we all are doing our different things. And I was amazed by it because when you hear stories like that, you're like, oh, okay. But they also proceeded to tell me that from the time they were married, they had made a promise that before God, they would always make sure that they give back to God from their first fruits. And I said, well, with eight kids, that's got to be hard because they weren't making a lot of money from what I could tell. They weren't rich people in any stretch of the imagination. You know, rich may be in the world's eyes, but not rich in our eyes in this country. They probably would have to struggle to make ends meet. But they said, no, we promised that we would give back to God. And, we, and they said, we will do it and we will continue to do it. And so they were. They, they, were, they, they were teaching their children, first and foremost, how to be good stewards, both in the household and in society and in the church. They were teaching their children how to give back. And they were very involved in their parish. They were doing all sorts of things. And the kids had to be part of all of that, whether it was being altar serving, serving in music ministry. It was doing other things like helping out in the religious education. All the different things, their children were involved. Eight of them would come all during the week to get things done. They themselves as parents, you would figure <laughs> they'd be pretty busy people, were also too very involved in their parish. As they're telling me all of this, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, wow, they're, they're like a kind of impressive family. But then when they told me that they also give from their financial resources of their first fruits, that's when I said, hold on a second, come on, I, I, that's got to put a real strain on you. I mean, you know, you're trying to feed eight children, you're housing eight children, that's got to put a real strain on you. And they said, We've never hesitated to give to God, and God has never hesitated to give back to us. And everything seemed to work out, they said. They don't know why, they don't know how, but it always seemed to work out. They were always blessed with more than enough to feed their own and still take care of others. That, to me, is anything but ordinary. There is nobody that I did. Most people that I speak to... <laughs> They sit down, they plan things out, and the church is on the bottom of the list when it comes to their financial giving. It's just, you know, we got to pay all our other bills first. And, and people obsess and they worry about things and they, and they get so controlled by things. Today we see in our readings the epitome, the epitome of generosity. The two widows. I mean, I love that first reading. I really love that first reading. I don't know why. But I just love it like, you know, here's this total stranger that approaches a widow. And a widow is the epitome of dependent. 
because widows didn't have, they, they weren't out able to, to earn a, a living and all the other stuff. And so in this drought, she's sitting there saying, hey, listen, what little I have is almost gone. I have nothing left to give. But the prophet says to her, no, 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 you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Now, if someone came along and said, give your last of whatever, the last morsel of food you had, some total stranger from another nation that comes and says, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. How many of you would trust that person and give them your last morsel of food? I know I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably be like, no, no, my head is, I got it all figured out. This is it. I'm going to, I got to figure out what I'm going to do for tomorrow. And you're asking for me from, from what I've got today. I, I, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Now, this widow, God bless her, says, all right, on your word. And it worked out. It's just one of those readings in the Old Testament that just has always fascinated me because she did trust. Do we trust God that much? It's a perfect example because we see the widow in the gospel doing the same thing. Do we trust God that much? You shall love the Lord your God unreservedly. You should be giving to God unreservedly. Now, I don't want any of you to become destitute. So I'm not talking about foolishness for God. I'm talking about returning to God, giving back to God, serving God. As I said a few weeks ago, there's a real issue in the Catholic Church because most of our financial resources come from the fewest amount of our parishioners, and most of what gets done in the parish comes from the fewest number of parishioners. I ask all of you sitting here, you know your life, you know where you're at. Are you giving completely to God? Are you trusting God? Are you serving God? Are you doing for God? And how much are you doing for God? There's an exercise I take on in my own life every now and then, and I'll ask you to do this exercise this week. Try to keep track of what you do all week long. It requires you to probably carry around the pad or put it into your phone somewhere. Where you just, How many hours do you give and what do you give it to? How much money do you have and where do you spend it? It's a good exercise to do, and at the end of the week, add it up. How much time did I give to God? How much money did I give to charity? I'm always shocked every time I do it for myself because I am, it's so easy to whittle away some time, to go on the computer and, you know, you think you're going to be doing your, like, I'm going to do my work for, for the parish, and I'm going to get something done, and all of a sudden I've been on Facebook for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. You know, what am I wasting my time there for? There's nothing going on there. And you can, you can look at your own lives, how much time we waste not for God. You shall love the Lord your God. I took this challenge one time and I said, I want to give 10% of my time to prayer. 10%, that's two and a half hours a day, basically. Two and a half hours a day to prayer. Now, most people will say, oh, two and a half hours, that's a lot of time. I mean, well, you know, you got to sleep at some point. So, all right, so you take the seven or eight hours off. Now we're down to only like you know, 16 hours left to get two and a half hours out of, oh my goodness, when are you going to get the time to do that? And I, you know what? I'm well over two and a half hours these days. I was inspired by Pope John Paul II. I used to read how he would put anywhere between five and six hours a day before the Blessed Sacrament. Five or six hours a day. And he was the pontiff. He was the successor to St. Peter. And he says, no, 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 no. I've got to make this my first priority. There's no way I can be the vicar of Christ and not have spent some time with the one I love. Not have spent some time with the one who is my all. And I, when I read that, I was just like, you know, man, I am just such a slouch. I really need to, to really get more out of, you know, in my own life. It is there if you want to find it. The time is there if you really look at your life. The resources are there if you really want to spend time. But my dear brothers and sisters, that's what we call a sacrifice. We have to make a sacrifice. Love truly, if it, love is to be what it's supposed to be, willing the good of the other, I can't necessarily will the good of God. God is all good, but I can return to God. I can make a sacrifice for God out of my time, out of my talent, out of my resources. That's a challenge, my dear brothers and sisters, for you and for me. Jesus wants us to know that he still loves us. He's there for us. Even if we're only giving him a few minutes each day, it's a start. He's there, like, all right, I'm there for you. Just don't not pay attention to me. Don't not 
give yourself to me. He can't do much of anything when we're not paying attention. I've, ha- I've heard so many people who will come up to me in times of destitute. They're just, everything is falling apart in their lives. Their marriage is falling apart. Their finances are falling apart. And, and now they say, why is God punishing me? I say, God's punishing you? How do you know God's punishing you? I, I, it has to be God's punishing me. How do you know that? And then I'll ask them, how much time do you pray every day? How much do you serve God? How much do you give to God? Maybe God's been trying to help you and you're not listening. Oh, that that can't be it. Well, why don't you just try it? And I always tell them the same thing. Try to stop in the church every day for 15 or 20 minutes and just pray. Just don't, don't ask God for anything. Don't tell God anything. Just listen to God speaking to your heart. And inevitably, even within a few weeks, they'll figure, figure it out. No, I was the problem, not God. I was punishing myself. I was hurting myself by not giving myself to God. I couldn't imagine my day now without the amount of time that I spend with God. I couldn't imagine what my life would be like if I didn't pray more. And as a priest, you better expect that of us because we should be doing a lot of it. But that doesn't exempt you. That doesn't get you off the hook. And so my dear brothers and sisters, do that little examination this week. Test yourself and to see how much you really do give to God. What is it that you're offering to him? What service do you give him? Do you get involved here at the parish at all? Are you doing anything at all beyond just sitting in the pew for an hour and a week? Are you serving God? Are you giving back to God? Are you giving back to God by a percentage or I have a couple of coins left in my pocket. Here you go, God, do what you can with them. It's a challenge. I take that challenge and I want you now to take that challenge because next week we wrap this series up with those hard words from Jesus, talk of the second coming and judgment. That's what our motivation is. I love God with all my heart, mind and soul because I want to be with him for all eternity in the next. Remember that from the catechism? Yeah. And so my dear brothers and sisters, this morning I encourage you, I ask you, I say to you, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul and loving your neighbor will fall right into place because it'll be real easy. Go forth and live the truth of God's love for you by loving God first and then loving others. God bless you.